Should we take another look at how people can sue a newspaper? I'm Scott Ott with Bill Whittle and Stephen Green in this episode of Right Angle, brought to you by the members at BillWhittle.com. And gentlemen, there's an, a thought-provoking piece by the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal um, under the headline, Reconsidering Times versus Sullivan. And we'll provide a link for this um, at BillWhittle.com, although it's possible you may need a subscription to see it. Not to BillWhittle.com, although you should have that already, but possibly to the Wall Street Journal. Um, Judge Lawrence Silberman of the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals recently uh, wrote a partial dissent in a case called Ta versus Global Witness. And in it, he said that the court needs to re-examine a decision from years ago called Times versus Sullivan that made it so that if you're trying to sue somebody like the New York Times for libel... It's not enough to just prove they printed something false about you. You have to prove actual malice, a reckless disregard of the truth. And, and Stephen Green, this to me is interesting, not only because I was a journalism student years ago when I thought journalism was a thing, uh, but it, the idea of how far should we allow people to seek punishment or money damages against the media, so to speak, the, the, the journalistic enterprise, before it starts to get to the point where they back off and don't cover things that we really want them to cover. And the Wall Street Journal editorial board, in part, said in their editorial that the cost of defending against uh, trivial or what do they call that? What's the when you file a nuisance court case? lawsuits? Yes, yes, those yeah. kinds of things for defamation purposes. It costs the newspaper a substantial amount of money to defend against these things, and having a high standard to prove is valuable to the enterprise of journalism because we don't want to squelch the freedom of the press. Do you think the Times versus Sullivan standard of actual malice, reckless disregard for the truth should stand, or are you with uh, Justice Silberman and think that we may need to reexamine that in light of the frequency with which major media sources are wrong about things? I think we do need to re-examine, and I don't say that lightly at all. Um, but you, two things are true. Two things are are so apparent to me that I, I hold them to be self-evident. One is that we have a terrible, terrible news media. In fact, I, I usually call them the infotainment industry because news is sort of tangential to what they do. The other thing is, it is virtually impossible to hold them to account uh, in a court of law or almost anywhere else. Uh, CNN has been peddling the uh, the, the very fine people uh, meme against former President Trump uh, ever since Charleston, which was what, 2017, 2018? It's not true. They truncated his statement to make it seem as though he was supporting a bunch of racist jerks, when in fact, that is the exact opposite of what he was saying. But under, under our law, under our Supreme Court precedent, it is impossible to hold them to account for this lie that they didn't just stay state once and then go, oops, but they repeat again and again and again. It's uh, it's an established part of the narrative now. And we could cite so many more examples just like it over the last four years. So clearly something is broken. Um, maybe the solution is we just need better viewers. We need more discerning viewers, but I don't know how we do that. Um, I know we need a better news media. I don't know how to get that either. As we said in the year, as I said it to you in the backstage, the standard for publishing a fact was to have two sources confirm it. Then you could be sure that even if it wasn't true, you had two sources who said it was, and that was your CYA. Um, now the news is chatter. It's rumor. It's hearsay. It's you won't believe what somebody said on Twitter. And then everybody can run with that because the first news outlet ran with that. And it's, it's, it's not what we were trained to think of when we were younger as reporting, as journalism, as news. It is social media with, uh, with, with, with teleprompters. Um, maybe we do need to revisit. I don't want to go too far the other direction because we do need a, a news industry. We do need freedom of the press. I just wish we had a press. <laughs> Bill Whittle, Judge uh, Silberman, in part of his analysis in this case, um, gets pretty provocative about it and says that the Supreme Court created this 
actual malice standard out of whole cloth with no basis in the Constitution, and frankly, overturning libel standards that had been slowly evolving over centuries in common law. Um, I, I, I'll honestly tell you, I don't know what the right thing to do here is, but I do know that I get a little itchy when we start talking about making it easier for people to go into a court of law and demand money from other people who may, you know, not the news business is on hard times in many places. So I'm thinking more about the some of the local papers or the medium-sized city papers or TV stations who could get slammed with a major lawsuit and find themselves unable to defend themselves, even if it was an innocent mistake. Um, how far are you willing to go in this process? I know you are. You've constantly said that you know this country would be great if only we had an actual uh, press, <laughs> uh, real journalism. Um, how far do you think we should be uh, able to go to enforce what we'd like to see in a court of law? Well. Let's just step way, way back and look at the like the the orbital view of this. It it is built into the structure of the country that this that this kind of government cannot function without a virtuous people. It's just that simple. You cannot allow people to be free if those people are not, as a general rule, virtuous. If if people aren't virtuous and you let them be free, then they're going to do all kinds of things to break the law, and then you've got to go in and enforce the law. And the example that Steve gave is a great example of this. Even 50 years ago or even less, the idea that a newspaper would knowingly continue to publish they knew to be something they knew to be untrue would be something that they wouldn't do out of professional pride, out of internal virtue, out of standards of, of respect for the truth and honesty. It simply wouldn't have happened. They would have been thrown out on their ear and any reporter or editor who said, well, we know it's not true, but we should run it anyway, they would have been kicked out the door. Now, when you take the virtue out of society and you take the virtue out of the out of the press, the, the the professionalism that would prevent you from running something that you knew to be false or something that you created to be false, now you have to go to the other end of the of the um, equation. Now you have to start balancing it on the other end. Now you've got to start making the penalties for this kind of intentional malice, this kind of intentional um, vindictiveness, easier to achieve. I happen to agree with what he said about, about creating it out of whole cloth. My understanding of it is this. Well, let me just, let's just break it down. If somebody says something that's not true, they don't go to jail for that. They shouldn't have to pay any, there should be no action available to that person. People are wrong all the time. It just, everybody's wrong. I'm not, but, but other people are wrong all the time. So that's, that's certainly not legally actionable. To say that I personally think the standard should be if somebody publishes something that they know to be false, that to me is, is I think, a, a reasonable standard for, for legal damages. If somebody prints a story that they know is false, for example, if somebody were to take an interview and pull sentences out of it, and then you were to be able to present to the judge, here is everything in context. Again, back to Steve's example with Donald Trump and, and, and Charlotte. They have edited out everything to spin this around. That That's a conviction as far as I'm concerned. My understanding, though, is that now the standard is they have to prove something that's not, they have to publish something that's not true, and they have to have known it's not true, and they had to have known it was not true and done it to hurt you intentionally. And that is essentially... you. You cannot prove that because you cannot get inside their head. If you have to prove, no, he knew it wasn't true and he did it to hurt me. I don't know. There's no defense against that. I think, I think it has gone too far. But ultimately, Scott, what you really got here is a major problem in terms of what is the press. I mean, if, if in this country, if I told you that we were going to increase restrictions on, on, uh, on medical malpractice suits, we would know that there's a class of people that this applies to and everybody else it doesn't apply to. Medical doctor is a licensed profession. And once you step into that arena, you bear responsibilities that come with that profession. Same is true for a lawyer. They have to pass a bar exam. You can't just apply the same standards to somebody who's got an opinion as you would to a lawyer in a, in, a, in a law case. We don't have an official press. We don't have a licensed press. I don't think we should have a licensed press. Although, 
I have to tell you, once again, back to the initial argument, if the press continues to abuse their ability to tell the truth as the, as the truth is known to them, I'm starting to look more kindly upon the idea of a licensed press that can be held accountable in the same way that a doctor can for malpractice, professional malpractice. You are a licensed reporter. You've sworn to tell the truth as you see it. You knew this was false. Therefore, pony up. And if there ever was a licensed press in this country, I would certainly do everything in my power to make sure that I was never considered one under any circumstances. <laughs> Well, there are so many aspects of this story that I found interesting, and it's 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 funny for me what you find kind of on in section C of the newspaper, you know, rather than on the front page, because to me this is is more engaging and more important to the future of the republic than a lot of the stuff that shows up on page one. Uh, first of all, I'm a man of a certain age, and I can remember when during the evening newscast, uh, the news was presented as if it were straight news. Now, obviously, it's being done by people who have opinions. And, and will slant things and say things with a certain tone of voice and use certain language. But then at the end of the newscast, they would often have a minute of opinion. And the opinion would be segmented from the rest of the newscast by showing the signature of the person who was giving the opinion across the bottom of the screen. So that was the signal to the home audience that, okay, now we've stepped out of the, we're telling you what happened today, and now I'm telling you what I think about it, and my name is Howard K. Smith. You know, and An editorial. His, Yes, the editorial is clearly delineated. It occurs to me as I think about the, especially the 24-7 news channels and talk radio and a lot of things like that, that there's very little actual news going on, especially in broadcast media and uh, things that are happening on, on uh, social networks. Um, a lot of this is watching personalities and hearing opinions. And we know when we tune into CNN that we're not tuning into a particularly neutral arbiter of the facts, but uh, here's the test. Would you watch CNN if they had a rotating cast of anchors every night, if they just got a different person from their organization to read from the teleprompter each night that which is the news, would you tune in for the newscast? And my guess is you would not because you're tuning in because you want to see Wolf Blitzer or John King or Poppy Harlow or whoever it is that you like, you like to listen to them. You like their personalities. You like their opinions. And I don't mean you, our audience, of course, but I mean, there are people who do this. And so it's not really journalism. So how do you hold them to a standard of journalism? Bill was correct when he said that there were people in the early days of the founding of this republic who believed that the only way a republic could stand is if you were, uh, it was formed of a virtuous people. But that wasn't the universal opinion at the time. That was more of a John Adams kind of opinion at the time. Adams was a strong believer and and a little persnickety about it himself that you had to have this <laughs> virtuous people. What we actually wound up with as a product uh, of this process to govern with a, vir a virtuous people was a bunch of checks and balances because we know people aren't going to be virtuous. And so everything, the way the whole constitutional structure is, it is designed by guys who knew that given the chance, a lot of people would not be virtuous and we needed to protect ourselves from each other and from our own selves. And so they set up this checks and balances system. Um, and in that day, it was very common in newspapers to read pseudonymous screeds viciously attacking other people. So people were using fake names so that they could lace into somebody else who probably was the neighbor, you know, four miles down the road in the neighboring farm. Um, and they would viciously insult each other. And this includes some of the top people whose names are very famous. And uh, for those of you who've studied history, these are people who appeared in the musical Hamilton. So this is the kind of, these kind of people would actually change their names and publish things or hire people to write things under false names to disguise their own identity. Um, so it's not like it's something new, this defamation that is happening. I'm very leery of any kind of uh, court decision or law that would make it easier for people to 
punish people for, for free speech. Steve Green has said it often here before, and he's probably quoting some famous person I don't know, but the remedy to bad speech is more speech. And that is when somebody defames you, uh, then you should have an opportunity, and we certainly do today, to get out a contradiction of that defamation. And when you talk about the specific incident of President Trump's remarks regarding the Charlotte, it was at Charlotte or Charlottesville, I can never remember which one of those it was, but those remarks taken out of context well, heck, we have the full quotes. <laughs> we have access to that. And just because maybe the New York Times won't run them or Morning Joe won't put them on MSNBC doesn't mean that that full context can't get out there. But I'll be honest with you, there's not a big market for full context. You try doing that straight news show. You try stripping the personalities out of it and stripping the opinions out of it and see who watches it. News is a sport and people are not in it for facts and truth, they're in it for the thrill. Um, that is not journalism in my mind, it's entertainment, but I still think the courts should keep their fingers out of it. For Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks to the members at BillWhittle.com for making Right Angle possible.